Yes. Good, uh, good morning to all of you. Good morning. It's great to see you. Um, we are so excited that the young, our young people have come back from uh, an exciting trip to Oklahoma. And we are going to hear a couple of testimonies later on. It's going to be, was, uh, I heard, very exciting, very memorable thing for all of them. Now, talking about exciting, when I first moved here uh, to Dallas in 2007, it was uh, quite an exciting year for us. We have been praying, Radha and I and uh, my two boys, we've been praying uh, for direction regarding uh, our decision to go to, to come here to Dallas so I can go to Dallas Seminary. Now back then, I was working as a, uh, as a night consultant in my own uh, consulting business, and my wife Radha was a uh, physical therapy uh, assistant manager in a local hospital. So through one answered prayer to another, the Lord has confirmed our uh, uh, move and removed all hindrances that we have in coming over to Dallas. Now, little did we know that uh, once we come here, that we were going to go through one of the most difficult times in our life as a family and as individuals. First, um, when, we, when we arrived here, we didn't know that Prada would be able to work. Our initial plan was for her to work so I could study full time and then just for me to work part time. Uh, there was a uh, uh, the, the physical therapy board here in Texas decided that she was missing one course and which we didn't know. So she, she ended up uh, being at home full time and then I ended up working full time. Uh, fortunately, uh, blessing also, before we moved to Dallas, I already visited uh, DBS in uh, what they call the day of uh, DDS day. So it's where potential students visit uh, the seminary to see if uh, that is where they want to go. So several months prior to our move here, um, I already visited DPS and um, had an interview with uh, DART, the transportation company. So they uh, hired me and I told them if you can please post postpone my working until uh, we come over here, then that would be great. And they agreed to it. So, uh, and so we thank God that uh, I got accepted to that job, so I worked there as uh, full time. Um, now second, a few weeks, however, after I got accepted, after I started working at DART, um, they implemented the new technology in the company. To, uh, something that I was totally unaware of. It was really foreign to me. And my boss kept asking me, do you know this technology? Do you know this technology? I said, well, I can learn it. And you know, I, um, uh, I'm used to uh, studying technology. But he felt he needed someone who can right away take on the, the responsibilities. So he made sure to let me know that uh, uh, he, need, he wanted someone else. Um, he used uh, harsh tactics to, to uh, make me feel that way, like you know, the simple shouting in front of the whole department while I was sitting, <laughs> like, like those. But he wouldn't do that to anyone else, just to me. Oh, it was really so difficult that I would come home literally shaking. Uh, after uh, several weeks of this. Uh, and I know that I was talking to one brother last week and he was also going through the same thing. So I understand what's happening to your brother. I'm not going to mention your name. Um, now, while this was happening, uh, we heard from the Philippines news that uh, my wife's mother was gravely ill. So needless to say, she had to go home. Um, and then, en route to the Philippines, uh, she learned later on that her mother actually died. So it was really so devastating to her and, and to me as well. Now, I was there working full time, my wife several hundred miles away, with two boys also, uh, I'm looking after two, uh, two boys that who were, I think, in their um, middle school. Uh, and in a job that uh, I didn't like. I hated it. <laughs> so it was so difficult. And then, that, but that wasn't the, the end of the ordeal. 
two weeks before my wife came home, I was fired from that. So both of us in, in Dallas without any job, and I was working and got two boys. You know, those, those times I was just crying out, God, <laughs> what are you doing? I was shouting, Lord, I can't understand. And then suddenly it hit me. Ah, I'm seeing the logic to this. You know what he was doing? I told God, I know God what you're doing. You brought me here so my friends from Chicago, my Christian friends from Chicago, won't see that you're killing me because of all the stupid things I've done in my life back there in Chicago. That's what I think you're doing. Man, just in a few short weeks, in a few short months, I, I say, I mean, we were going through a wilderness experience. I don't know about you, have you experienced something like that? Whether it is something you've done or something you have not done, you just finally, you just suddenly find yourself going through a wilderness experience. It really doesn't matter what uh, your age is, what your gender is, or whether you are a full-time Christian or not. Wilderness will come to all of us. And this wilderness is what is metaphorically referred to in the Bible as time of testing. Um, so what we are going to do here is we're going to look at the text and we're going to see that God actually gives us wilderness experiences to grow us. Now our text, I'm not going to read the text, but if you have uh, your Bibles, please open it to Deuteronomy chapter 8. And what we're going to do is we, we are going to first discover that wilderness in the life of a believer is to be expected as a necessary part of walking with God. Second, we will see to what purpose God gave it and how He does it. And finally, by way of application, we will look at the proper responses to such an ordeal. So first, God leads to us to a wilderness, to the wilderness. For those of you who have been reading uh, the book of Exodus, you know that even at the beginning when God called Israel out of Egypt, that the plan of the Lord was to make them go through the wilderness. There is actually a direct route. There's actually a direct route from Egypt to Kadesh Barnea, which is the door, you know, it's just right at the door of Canaan, which is right here. There's a direct route. And even with 600,000 men, so you include the women, the children, the elderly, and then the foreigners, the Egyptians, that uh, as scholars are estimating it to be about 2.4 million. So even with 2.4 million and uh, walk, uh, traveling there by foot, it was just 11 days. It's just a short 240 miles. So it's just like going to Houston. But you would read in Exodus that the Lord, the plan for God was to take them around through, Mount, through Sinai. So they traveled from Goshen to Sinai for about three months, and then in, there they stayed for about two more years. Why? Because God wanted to have, God wanted his people to have an encounter with him. How? Through the giving of his word, uh, uh, the law, the Torah, and uh, the civil laws and the Ten Commandments, and then also through the creation of the tabernacle for worship. So the plans and the construction of the tabernacle for worship all happened in the, uh, right here in Mount, Mount Sinai. So after two years, they were ready. So that completes the completed the first leg of their wilderness journey. Now, after that, they went to Kadesh Barnea, and uh, you, you're very familiar with this story also. What happened was that they sent out 12 uh, people to, spies, to spy on uh, the land. And of course, we know that 10 people came, came back, 10 spies came back and said, oh, we can't conquer, except for Joshua, Joshua and Canaan. And uh, 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 the Lord God in Numbers 14 uh, made the promise that his people, the first gen, won't be able to go to the promised land. And you're familiar with that, with that story. Now, why am I pointing this? It's because 
I wanted us to notice that the wilderness, contrary to many, many, uh, uh, the way people are thinking is just a result of disobedience. No, because for two and a half years, God planned for them to go to Sinai to worship and to create them, uh, to, give, to be given the laws. And then the 38 years, which is the second leg of their journey, was a result of disobedience. That was the longer, the longer one. Do you think the people, when God called them out to, uh, out of Egypt, they enjoyed or they liked the idea of going through Sinai? You know, if you read your text, it says there, God led them through Sinai. Man, probably if I was there, I would say, well, wait, wait, clarify it. I haven't attended Pastor Robert's uh, Bible study methods. Through? I prefer around. Not through the wilderness. I prefer the direct route to Egypt. Not through. But God led them through the wilderness. And you know how it is. In the desert. How many of you have been uh, to Israel, or at least a desert? Any, anyone here have gone through uh, California's uh, I don't know, Death Valley or something? Uh, so a few of you, a few of you. Uh, I've, I've been to um, desert, and look at the, uh, the description of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 15. Verse 15, God led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions of thirsty ground where there was no water. Wow. I wouldn't want to go through that place. But again, I've been through, uh, I've been through uh, Israel and this is Mount uh, Har Karkom, which is believed to be one of the sites where the Mount Sinai sites. And uh, this is my team on top of that, uh, of Harkar Kong, looking over the valley. Um, and this is what you will see uh, when you're on top, nothing but brown desert. Uh, it's, it, it is really a desolate place. It gets very, very cold in the evening and then very, very hot during the day. And if you look down on the floor, this is what you're going to see. These are flint stones. You know, flint stones are used to create tools, right, for cutting. Uh, this is uh, this is um, this is it when you're walking through it. They are very very sharp. If you put your if your finger on the edge and then you move it a little bit, I I try that. <laughs> it's not very smart. <laughs> it's like because uh, I wanted to feel how sharp it is. It's the first time I've seen a uh, flint stone. So uh, it's like a, a hot knife uh, running through a mel melted butter. It was really very, it was really very sharp. And you know, think of that as you're thinking through the what Moses said. Your clothing did not wear out. What a miracle that was, right? That was really <laughs> a miracle. Um, but you know what? When it comes to biblical wilderness. It doesn't have really to be a physical wilderness for people to experience the desert in their lives. If you go to Hebrews chapter 3, uh, the writer of Hebrews wrote to some Greek and uh, Roman readers who were not in a literal desert but were going through some spiritual wilderness. Uh, listen to the allusion to the, to the wilderness. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. Can you hear the assumption in these words? The Hebrew readership, or the Greek and Roman readers, were going through some tough times spiritual wilderness but contrary to what Israel thought was the desert to what the desert was for or to what many people think spiritual wilderness is for and that is death they think that you know what you go to the desert that means death God is uh, making it hard for us causing us hardship going to die in God's point of view it is something else 
It is actually God's holy pasture land. A holy place where he transforms his people. Look at this uh, quote from, um, from uh, the director of, uh, of uh, the Israel trip where I went, who I went with. He says that the wilderness, oops, sorry, sorry, move forward. The wilderness is an excruciating complex, custom-made set of personal tribulations that Father God has sovereignly allowed in your life. Do you hear that? Custom made for you. Personal tribulations. Just for you. But you're probably saying, I didn't sign up for that. You know, when some when uh, my friend shared me the gospel, and I, again, I read through Deuteronomy, I'm not sure if I, I'll be accepting our Lord Jesus Christ right away. The, the truth is, you can't get away from it. Here's another quote from uh, Bill Morris, pastor and writer. He says, the wilderness is a grand metaphor for life and growth and preparation for supernatural opportunities and painful moments. The place where God takes us to make us ready to be used by Him in ways we never thought possible. Wow. <clears throat> Having read this, how many of you will say, Lord, wilderness, I want to sign up, <laughs> right? Sign me up. I want to be used by you in ways I never thought possible. You know, virtually everyone whom God has used mightily has gone through a spiritual wilderness, whether it's, it be physical, you know, like Moses and David and Elijah and even Jesus Christ our Lord. Or whether it be metaphorical, going through some difficulties in your life. What is your spiritual wilderness right now? Are you going through some difficulties because of uh, a co-worker? You know, you go through, you know, somebody see, see somebody running here. <laughs> Quite difficult, right? When you're going through that, you're coming home and you just feel so frustrated because uh, somehow you're not understanding, he or she is not understanding what's happening. And you try as you might to reach out. He's not, or she is not responding. How about a difficult relationship right now? How about financial distress? Are you going through one of those? You don't know where you're next. Money is, and it's not. It's not. Uh, it, it, it's not secret to all. Our, bro our brother, um, <laughs> brother Zion, is going through one of those. How about this? Is there sin in your life? So, you know, the reason why I pointed out earlier about the journey <coughs> of uh, the the Israelites during that two and a half years and the forty years because. God planned this whole wilderness journey when they were, quote, following God, quote, unquote, and during their time of disobedience. It was all God, God's grand plan. So you might be going through a wilderness because of something that you had no control over. It just kind of fell onto your lap and you're just like, wow, God, this is so difficult. A sickness that won't go away, a habit that you've been trying to kick out uh, a depression. Your boyfriend, hopefully not. <laughs> when you're hopefully not your spouse. <laughs> because you should be together in that wilderness, like against each other. But that, that happens. What is your wilderness? It is custom made for you by your Father God. Look at verse 5. Look at verse 5. Look at the heart, heart of God on this matter. He says, Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. Do you hear the heart of God there? Do you hear the Father's heart? God, our Father, is saying, Hey, you know, I got you. I know why you're going through this. It is painful, but I'm your father, and I'm letting you go through this difficulty. It is for your good. How many of 
you watch uh, American football? Okay, you like American football. How many of you here are Dallas Cowboys fan? I have to ask this. You know, because I want to make sure that when I leave, I'm going to watch out for you. For you, man. You know why? Because I'm a Bears fan. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Three cheers for Chicago Bears. <laughs> but, uh, you know, whenever I watch the Chicago Bears play when I was still living in Chicago, it always bugs my mind how they can play in deep freezing temperature with snow and all the mush and all the wet and, you know, go against each other. And, and uh, I don't know if uh, I've seen Dallas play the Chicago Bears in, in a setting like that. Yeah, one time. One time. Dallas You know why? You know why? Because I just learned that no football uh, team who ever plays in, in artificial turf and in an enclosed dome ever won yeah. Super Bowl. Never. You know, the training, the coaches knew this. Chicago Bears knew this. Coach Bears. <laughs> yeah. LA, it's really cold. And you don't know what cold is if you haven't lived in Chicago. Uh, the first time, oh, you have. Okay, I see some nodding here. The first time I, I, uh, I moved here to the U.S. in 1993, there was a severe we weather. Um, and I can remember one thing from the news. And the newscaster was saying, today, it's colder than the North Pole. It is minus 62 degrees Fahrenheit wind chill. Minus 62 degrees. Have you ever tried during one of those uh, winter winters in Chicago going out, and you're wearing uh, uh, pants and you forgot to put, uh, you know, an in inner uh, armor? You won't just walk out for about a few seconds, and you will be in pain when your pants touches your skin, your leg skin. It is that cold, and so one time I was walking like this because I forgot my. <laughs> forgot my uh, uh, armors inside. And then your hands you put double, and then you try to insert as much as you can that uh, warmer, the thing that uh, you squeeze and then it becomes warm. Because that's how cold it is in Chicago. It is very difficult when we are going through pain. But the coach of the Chicago Bears and the Green Bay Packers know about this. What, what more our God? He knows what's good for us and what's best for us and allows us to go through such wilderness experiences, painful, very painful moments. But what purpose does our Father give you your wilderness experience? How does He accomplish His purpose? If you read verse 2, He does it two ways. Verse 2 says, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. First, it's to humble us. We like to do things on our own. We take pride in accomplishing and doing things with our own hands. And there's nothing wrong with that. We have been, we are gifted. We have been gifted by God. You know, I have a thing with playing drums. I've never learned to play drums. So when Graham was playing that drum earlier, man, uh, that was awesome. <laughs> and I was doing that. Huh? Did you notice that? Yeah. Where's Graham? You have to teach me. Okay, there you go, Graham. That was really super awesome. How long did you practice that? Don't tell me one week. And I'll be. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, you're very talented. And so, when we use our spiritual gifting, God is honored by that. He has given us gifts, but it is so easy to blur doing things for God and doing things for us, especially when we start uh, being comfortable doing the things that we are, uh, that God has gifted us in. So we, for, we, forgot, we forget to pray before we do things. Forget to consult him about what we need to do. And soon we are acting on our own. 
Ayn Rand, the American novelist and philosopher who created objectivism, which is a philosophy of living on earth, said, man's destiny is to be a self-made soul. Man's destiny is to be a self-made soul. Do you agree with that? Nothing like helplessness will take that away from you, right? There's this funny commercial I've seen many, many years ago where this, this lady say, I am God. I am, uh, she, she was shouting by the beach, I am God, I am God. And then, very, then the, 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 the camera starts focusing out. I am God, I am God. Because now we're looking at it from the point of view of several thousand miles, and then that voice of I am God is barely, you can barely hear it. It's, it's foolish. It's foolish. The helplessness crushes that. It crushes it. Look at verse 3. Look at what God did. God let the people go hungry, and hungry they were. In Exodus chapter 16, verse 3, they were so hungry that they started dreaming about their days in Egypt when they had food stomachs. So they started thinking about the lamb chops, the shish kebabs, and uh, hummus. And because there were foreigners there, I told the first service that, you know, they also started dreaming about adobo and pasit and lumpia. There were foreigners there, right? Uh, so uh, if you listen to the cult from the Philippines, you will say that, he will say that, uh, there's this leader called in the Philippines that uh, the Philippines is actually the source of uh, God's people, etc. So it's, it's a lot of uh, baloney. But that, the, 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 the wilderness is not just confined to the OT, where God makes us hungry. Remember when Jesus fed the 4,000 in Mark 8? Not the 5,000, but the 4,000. They have been following Jesus for several days now for three days to be exact. Finally, on the third day, when they became so hungry and almost about to faint, Jesus feeds them. Why wait for three days? These were people who were following Jesus. But Jesus waited for three days. And we find ourselves in the same, same way. We gave we give our lives to God, committed to loving our Father, and then suddenly we find ourselves in the middle of a wilderness journey at the end of our wits, with trying to figure out what to do on our own. Because that's our natural reaction. How humbling it is to find our carefully crafted reasoning suddenly broken into pieces. How humbling it is to find ourselves crying for help to someone who says he knows what's best for us. And we ask, really? Really, God, you know what's best for me? How humbling it is to know that our very existence ultimately depends on Him. When I was at DPS, our professor used to tell us that, well, our professor told us this story, and uh, this is a true story. I may have muddled the details of uh, two Chinese DPS students who were so desperate to, uh, 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 for resources. So what they did was they started praying and uh, walking, and as they were praying and walking, they finally found uh, a competition, a Mexican competition, uh, where you, whoever eats the hottest chili wins a prize of, I think, $200 or less. And guess who won the prize? These two DPS students who were so desperate <laughs> They won the prize. And nothing like helplessness makes us want to cry to God. And God answers our prayers. But notice how God answers our, uh, answered the prayers of Israel. God answered the prayers of Israel with something they are not aware of. They do not know. Something that was totally foreign to them. When I was working for Logos, I was asked to uh, present before Christ for the Nation during one of their events. Uh, Logos, if you, if you know Logos, Logos is a Bible software. 
so you have to use computer and then uh, projection to uh, show uh, you know the software. But 15 minutes before the presentation, I was told that uh, there's something wrong with the connection to the computer. I won't be able to use my computer. And if you know me, one of my fears, biggest fears, is actually speaking in front. It might not show you this much, but uh, you know, when I first applied for a job at Logos, and part of our job was to present uh, the software in front of people, I was one of the worst presenters. Good thing there was one worse than me. <laughs> so that person got fired. <laughs> He did not get accepted. I'm not saying that, uh, I'm, I'm just saying that that's how bad I was in presenting uh, in front of the public. And then one time, so I said, I told myself, oh man, I'll make sure when I come back to Logos and present, I'll make sure that I'll be good. I'll make good. So about two years afterwards, sure enough, we were asked to come back again to present. So there I was. I prepared a very special presentation for them that I thought I was the only one who knew. And it turned out that I was really only the, the only person who knew that presentation specialized. So I was there presenting with my laptop, and then the table started shaking like that. It was so hard that my, my laptop not just dropped, oh. it flew right there. <laughs> it flew several feet away. It was so embarrassing. It was so embarrassing. You know, I lost control. And I think that's what's happening when God fed these people something they were totally unaware of. So I was asking, how can mana, which people do not know, cause, cause them to be humbled? Well, they have to trust God with something that they have no control over. They do not even know that that's going to sustain them. Uh, they do not know, they did not know if uh, that was going to come daily. They just trusted the word of the Lord because God says it would come. It is a very, very humiliating time. But God still delivered and it humbled them. Second, testing. Now going back to 8.2 again, Deuteronomy 8.2, God tested the Israelites to know what was in their hearts. Now, obviously, the question is, does God have to test me to know what is in my heart? Doesn't God know already what's in my heart? Of course he does. Psalm 139, verse 4. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. Matthew 10, 29 to 30. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. One final First, Matthew 6, 8. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask of Him. So why does God say that you, He needs to know what was in your heart? You know the word know, yada, means to bring to light. So what is God trying to bring to light? What He is bringing to light is not your reaction, so we will know, oh, that's how... Uh, uh, Pastor Oli will react to uh, my testings. No. It is meant to reveal to us how we will react. You know, I love eating guava. When I went home to the Philippines, I had uh, I had the opportunity to, to, to get this big guava, which was green enough and yellow enough that uh, tells me that this is sweet. Not raw, that when you bite it, it's sour, but not so ripe that when you bite it, it's, it's so soft. It was just good enough for me. Uh, what, so I, I took a bite out of it, and right on, it was really sweet. What I didn't notice was, when I looked at it right away, was there was somebody ahead of me feasting on that guava. <laughs> so I looked for that thing. They tried to uh, take the, the guava away from me. I looked and I looked and I couldn't find it. So, there you go. I had my uh, I had my vitamin C and protein uh, 
infusion that day. It was very good on the outside, but bad on the inside. I know, I like how Eddie Broussard, the Vice President of the Navigators, puts it. He says that in his book, Disciplines in the Heart, that when we are tested, we become disillusioned, right? And he says, the word disillusion, if you take it apart, this means to uh, separate. So when you are tested, this illusion, you are being separated from any illusions that you have about your faith and yourself. Suddenly, who you are becomes, becomes bare. Testing does that. Look at what it says in 1 Peter 1.7. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire, tested and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you see, it reveals who we are. But once you see who we are and we are such weak people with weak faith. It is not meant to make us despair. Verse 5, remember this. Verse 5 of Deuteronomy 8 says, As a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. That's the heart of God in what is happening here. As a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. The Father, heart of God, Biblical discipline was never meant to destroy. It is meant to build us in our faith. Hebrews 12, 11, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So we see that God gives us lesser experiences in our lives to grow us. And the way he accomplishes this, according to the text, is by humbling us, and by testing us. I'll tell you a closing story, my closing story, with the question of why God was doing this to us during that time, still burning in my heart. Rather and I prayed and decided to hold on to God's sovereignty and love, even though it felt so foreign to us. I don't know if you've experienced that, but there are times when you feel so disengaged with God. It feels like when you pray, there's like a ceiling and your prayers are not going through. I remember a verse that kept playing over and over and over in my head during that time. That was from Job, Job, sorry, Job. Job 1, 21. It says, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It just kept playing. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Going through the wilderness, I tell you, gave me some of the deepest lessons in my life about joy, about trusting. My joy was, was so, so overflowing during that time. With us. One time I was driving with my oldest son, Josh, and I said, telling him, you know, Josh, there's just so much joy. But I, we were going through some of, some of the most difficult times. It's a feeling of being empty, but at the same time being full. It's a feeling of uncertainty, but at the same time feeling very hopeful. I've learned what it is to surrender. Nowhere else except during that time, because one time I was sitting alone in my room, very dark, saying, God, you know, if this is your way, Making me grow. Bring it on. I don't want to say this, but if this is your way, bring it, bring it on. And looking back, I can say that the Lord has given me wilderness experience. And that was that the, and the purpose was to grow me. So in application, here's what I'd like you to do. And I would suggest that you do. For those of you who have gone through, or have just gone through, some wilderness experience, or are going through a wilderness experience, 
May I suggest that you gather your family together, just talk about it. You know, the, the Hebrew people, they love to remember. That's why in Deuteronomy 8, to the command there was for the Hebrew people to remember the wilderness experience. Gather with your family. I know some of you are not comfortable sharing with your family, but just go on with it. Just share what's happening to you. Share uh, what you've been through. And just take some time to listen to what God has been doing in the life of someone else. And then after that, verse 5 says, know in your heart. Know in your heart. To know is not just a mental ascent, because that it won't change your life. To know is an emotional a, 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 a commitment of the will to say, God, you are Father. That's what verse 5 says. Know in your heart. See? Not just know, but in your heart with everything you've got that God, your Father, is there right there with you through those wilderness. And then celebrate with uh, thanksgiving and prayer, and then maybe a meal afterwards. So it's pretty much like a Passover meal. So just, you know, with, with your family, do that this week. Now, however, there may be some of you here who are, who are going through the wilderness experience because of a sin in your life. May I suggest you run away from it as fast as you can right now. Why extend the wilderness experience to 40 years? I mean, Israel could have ended their wilderness experience after two and a half years when they were already at the doorstep of the promised land. Had they said, all of them said, the Lord has promised, let's go and conquer. But rebellion and sin extended that. And if you look at the end of verse 20, there's a warning. If we don't turn away from our sin, there might be destruction. You know what happened to uh, Ashley Madison, right? It was a website about two or three years ago that got exposed because uh, some hackers exposed the names of those who were signing up for that website. And that website is actually a place where you can sign up uh, to have an affair. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the names that, that came out were not just those of uh, people we, you know, that are actually uh, doing already in, uh, affairs. What got exposed were people from the church, elders, leaders, pastors, even a professor. And it got so bad that even one professor committed suicide. Why wait to get for it to get worse like that? If you know that you are in a wilderness experience right now, man, confess. Don't wait until 40 years after when you're saying, what did I do with my life? I could have confessed already before this. So celebrate if you're going through wilderness experience. Remember and know that God is your Father. But if you're going through a wilderness because of your own sin, confess right away. Father, we are so thankful to you for the lesson of the wilderness. Help us to remember this and not forget that you are faithful, that you are God our Father, who means to build us in our faith. Help us not to wither, but to remain trusting in you and acknowledging who you are and knowing that you are in control. Even if we don't feel it, Father, just our whole being to say, God, take over. In Jesus' name.